I've always wanted to own my own music since sure. I started making my music. And if you probably don't know this, but most of your favorite artists do not own their work. Um, the music industry is, uh, eh, you know. On November 12th, 2021, Taylor Swift released the album Red, Taylor's version, a re-recording of her fourth studio album, Red, from 2012. It's the second album she's re-recorded following Fearless, Taylor's version. That was released in April 2021, and it's a re-recording of her second studio album, Fearless. Taylor Swift has stated she plans to re-record and re-release all of her first six studio albums. But why has she decided to do this? There was, there was something that happened years ago where I, um, I made it very clear that I wanted to be able to buy my music. That opportunity was not given to me and it was sold to somebody else. And so I just figured I was the one who made this music first. I can just make it again. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. To fully understand the situation, we need to look at what it means to own music. In the music industry, there are two distinct and separate copyrights. The first copyright in music is for the composition of the song. This covers the words and some of the elements of the music in its written form. This is denoted by the common copyright symbol, a C inside a circle. In the early days of the music business, sheet music was printed and sold by publishers, who were sometimes also piano salesmen. As copyright laws for music became more established and recorded music became more lucrative, these publishers evolved into being essentially managers for the intellectual property of composers. Generally, publishing deals favour the writer financially, with the most common royalty split paying out 70% to the writer, while the publisher keeps the remaining 30%. But these terms are negotiable, so often newer, smaller artists get less favourable deals and bigger artists can demand better splits. The other copyright is the so-called phonographic copyright. This is denoted by a P inside a circle. It was first established to regulate recordings on the then newly invented phonograph machine. It now covers all recorded music. It's more commonly referred to as recording copyright, master rights, or simply the masters. It's this copyright that's acquired by record companies when signing an artist. Recording contracts are almost always structured to benefit the record company more than the artist. A common royalty rate would give just 15% to the artist, leaving 85% to the label. And all of this is after the label gets to recoup every single cost involved in making, marketing and distributing the recordings. That might already seem low, but surprisingly there have been worse deals. TLC's first contract gave them a royalty rate of just 7%, split three ways. And the Beatles' first deal with EMI was the equivalent of just 3%, split four ways. By default, major labels will want to sign the rights to the sound recording in perpetuity. That's forever. Forever, ever, forever, ever. The actual copyright term is currently 70 years from when the recording was first released. Record labels get around this limitation by constantly re-releasing remastered versions. These remastered versions are assigned new registration codes, known as ISRC, and are treated as new recordings, and the copyright term starts again. This enables the record company to make money from the recordings forever. Forever, ever. Taylor Swift was barely 14 years old when she signed her first contracts. She signed a two-year development deal with RCA Records, who hoped to acquire the rights to the young singer-songwriter's future recordings. She also signed a publishing deal with the publishing division of RCA's parent company, Sony. She was the youngest ever artist to sign for the publisher. Less than a year into the development deal, RCA told Taylor Swift they had no immediate plans to release her music and instead wanted to monitor her progress until she was 18. For a 14-year-old, that must have seemed like forever, especially as she'd already written lots of songs in anticipation of starting her recording career. So she did the unthinkable and walked away from the deal with RCA Records, the company that brought the world artists like Elvis Presley, Aretha Franklin and Britney Spears. It didn't take long for Taylor to get another shot. After an impressive showcase at the renowned Bluebird Cafe in Nashville, she met record executive Scott Borchetta, who was keen to sign her to his label. The only thing was he didn't have one yet. He'd just left his job at DreamWorks Records following the sale of the company to Universal, and he planned to start his own label. He told Taylor and her parents that once he'd secured the financing and set up the necessary infrastructure, he'd make Taylor Swift his first signing. And in 2005, he kept his word and returned to sign her up to his newly formed Big Machine label, and work began on her debut album. Released in 2006, the self-titled debut album was not an instant success. Only sold 40,000 copies in the first week. 
but rather than slide down the charts as expected, the album continued to sell steadily, and by November the 7th it had sold over a million copies. It peaked at number 5 in the charts. In contrast, her second album, Fearless, sold 575,000 copies in the first week and entered the charts at number 1. All of her next four studio albums went to number 1, with each release outselling the previous one. By the time she finished touring the sixth album, Reputation, she'd won 10 Grammys, an Emmy, 32 American Music Awards, 23 Billboard Awards and countless other awards and accolades around the world. Taylor was now one of the biggest recording artists on the planet. Her back catalogue of recordings was estimated to be worth around $150 million if sold. And remember, this is only one of the two copyrights related to her music. Her recorded music earned Big Machine an estimated $70 million a year, which was reportedly around 80% of the label's total revenue. So, as the clock ran down on her contract, she began negotiating a new deal that would incorporate some agreement that would allow her at some point to own her own masters. Big Machine offered her a deal where for every new album she submitted, she would get the masters to one of her old albums back. But as it had taken her 12 years to record and release the first six albums, at that rate it would be 2030 before she would own all of her own music. If 14-year-old Taylor Swift wasn't willing to wait four years for RCA, 29-year-old Taylor Swift was certainly not going to wait 12 years to own what she had created, so she declined the new deal. Around this time it was rumoured that Scott Pochetta was intending to sell Big Machine and was actively looking for a buyer. Taylor tried to negotiate to just purchase her masters outright, and with an estimated personal fortune of $325 million, it was well within her means but she was told they would only sell to her if she signed a new deal with the label. So again, she declined, and accepted that at some point Borchetta would sell the label to someone, and decided it best to just move on rather than be little more than a commodity in that sale. In November 2018, her deal with Big Machine ended, and she signed a new deal with the company that distributed Big Machine, Universal Music Group. On June 30th, 2019, it was announced that Big Machine Label Group had been purchased for $300 million by music manager Scooter Braun, whose clients included Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande. Taylor Swift says she found out about the sale from the public announcement, but some people have refuted that, pointing to the fact that her father owned 3% of the shares in Big Machine, so would likely have known about the sale. While it's true that her father was a shareholder in the company, it's possible that the sale was the subject of a strict non-disclosure agreement, or NDA, that would have prevented him from talking about it, even with his own daughter. So, just hours after the sale of the label was made public, Taylor Swift went public herself, to voice her dismay at the sale taking place without her knowledge and to someone she really didn't like. She described it as a worst-case scenario. So just what did she have against Scooter Braun? Well, it all started with this moment in 2009 at the MTV Video Music Awards. Yo, Taylor, I, I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. One of the best videos of all time. The apparently drunken Kanye was asked to leave the event and producers tried to console both Taylor and Beyonce, who are now both distraught backstage. Later in the night, Beyonce was awarded Best Video of the Year and used the moment to try and make it up to Taylor. I remember being 17 years old, up for my first MTV award with Destiny's Child, and it was one of the most exciting moments in my life. So I'd like for Taylor to come out and have her moment. Maybe we could try this again? Kanye later tweeted out an apology of sorts, but it didn't really put an end to the story, with even then President Obama voicing his opinion, albeit when he thought he wasn't actually being recorded. The young lady seems like a perfectly nice person. She's getting her award. What's he doing Why would up he there? Do that? He's a jackass. <laughs> In 2010, Taylor once again performed at the VMAs. The song Innocent was apparently directed to Kanye and contain references to the incident the previous year. Best female video goes to Taylor Swift. I always dreamed about what it would be like to maybe win one of these someday, but I never actually thought that would happen. Oh. 
Video footage of Kanye's interruption played on a screen at the back of the stage, perhaps signifying that she was trying to put the incident behind her. At the VMAs in 2015, Taylor Swift presented Kanye with an award and managed to get a laugh referencing Kanye's rant. I'm really happy for you, and I'm going to let you finish. But Kanye West has had one of the greatest careers of all time. And right now, I am honored to present the 2015 Vanguard Award to my friend, Kanye West. And that, it seemed, was that. Until the following year, when Kanye, now managed by Scooter Braun, released his single Famous. I feel like me and Taylor might still have sex. Why, I made that bitch famous. The video featured a naked Taylor Swift lookalike, which prompted the real Taylor Swift to brand it revenge porn. At the Grammy Awards later that year, Swift appeared to reference the ongoing scandal with Kanye in her speech. I want to say to all the young women out there, there are going to be people along the way who will try to undercut your success or take credit for your accomplishments or your fame. But if you just focus on the work and you don't let those people sidetrack you, someday when you get where you're going, you'll look around and you will know that it was you and the people who love you who put you there. And that will be the greatest feeling in the world. Thank you for this moment. Kanye claims he called Taylor Swift and asked for permission to use the lyrics, and she approved. Taylor denied this, saying that Kanye actually called to ask her to help promote his new single. Kim Kardashian then released a video that seemed to back up Kanye's story. Yeah, I mean, what, don't put up a line that's better. It's obviously very tongue-in-cheek either way. And I really appreciate you telling me about it. That's really nice. Oh, yeah. I feel like I just had a responsibility to you as a friend, you know. And, uh, I mean, thanks for being, like, so cool about it. Video footage of the entire phone call has now been leaked online. So you can hear for yourself that at no point during the 20 minute phone call did Kanye recite the line, I made that bitch famous. In fact, Taylor Swift voices concerns that she thought he was going to call her a dumb bitch and she was relieved that he didn't. So my next single, I wanted you to tweet it. It's the, it's a Good Friday, it's a Driving as a Good Friday song. So that's why I'm calling you that I wanted you to put the song out. Um, what would people, I guess it would just be people would be like, why is this happening? Well, the like they think it had something to do with it, probably. Well, the reason the reason why it, it will be happening is because it has a very controversial line at the beginning of the song about you. What does it say? Okay, uh, it says. Wait a second, you sound sad. Well, is it gonna be mean? No, I don't think it's mean. Okay, then let then let me hear it. Okay, it says. Um, to all my South Side that know me best, I feel like Taylor Swift might owe me sex. <laughs> <laughs> That's not me. Okay. I mean, yeah. I need to think about it because I just need to, like, you know, you hear something for the first time and you just need to think about it. Yeah. Um, because it is absolutely crazy. I'm glad it's not mean, though. It doesn't mm. feel mean. Um. Mm. But like, oh my god, the build-up you gave it, I thought it was going to be like, that stupid dumb bitch, like, but it's not. In the aftermath, Scooter Braun and his most famous client, Justin Bieber, began speaking publicly in defence of Kanye and taking digs at Taylor Swift whenever possible. Taylor characterised these public attacks as bullying and has never forgiven Scooter for his involvement in what she describes as her lowest moment. So with all that in mind, you can imagine her disgust at hearing who was now in control of all of her recorded music. It was then that she announced she was considering re-recording it all. In August 2019, she released her first new album for Universal Imprint Republic Records. Lover, like her previous five albums, sold over 500,000 copies in the USA in the first week, and by the end of the year had sold 3.1 million copies globally, making it the biggest selling album in the world that year. For Scooter Braun, however, everything was not going quite as well. 
The public backlash from his purchase of Taylor's former label continued to intensify. He said that he received death threats during that time. So less than 18 months after purchasing the label, he began looking for a buyer. He did offer to sell the company to Taylor Swift, but with the caveat that both parties would have to sign an NDA, preventing them from making derogatory statements about the other, or releasing any specifics about the deal. Feeling like this was too much to ask, she once again declined the offer. In October 2020, Big Machine was again sold, this time to Shamrock, an investment company started by Walt Disney's nephew, Roy. The exact amount paid for the company was never released publicly, but it's thought to be around the same $300 million that Scooter Braun paid. A few weeks later, Taylor Swift began the process of recording all of her albums again. Four months later, she announced she was finished re-recording Fearless and released the re-recorded version of the lead single in February 2021. The new recordings were to have the same titles with Taylor's version in parentheses so that fans could easily identify which versions they were listening to. Her fans began sharing different ways they could hide the original version of Fearless on streaming platforms such as Spotify so that they wouldn't unintentionally allow the new owners of her recordings to profit. When Fearless Taylor's version was released in April 2021, the original recording of the album was still in the Billboard Top 200 album charts at 157. The re-recording went straight in at number one and the original version fell off the charts altogether. It was working. Her fans were flocking to hear the new recordings and abandoning the old ones. Big Machine's revenue went from an average of $90 million a year to just $24 million in 2021. Another thing to keep in mind is that if someone wants to license a song for use in things like movies, TV shows, computer games or adverts, they need the permission of both the recording copyright holder and the composition copyright holder. Not only was Taylor Swift able to devalue the original recordings on streaming platforms, as the owner of the composition copyright, she could limit the use of the old sound recordings too. In short, she now holds all the power and control over her music, which is what she always wanted. As a result of the very public battle over control of her music, other artists are now looking at their own recording contracts and wondering if they should also be owning their own masters. It's actually quite surprising it's taken this long for artists to come to this realisation. The first high-profile instance of artists re-recording their own work dates back to 1960, when the Everly Brothers, the group that heavily influenced the Beatles in their early days, left their label Cadence and signed for Warner. They then re-recorded the hits they'd had on the previous label just a couple of years earlier. Warner turned a huge profit on these new recordings, while Cadence, starved of revenue, went bust. As a result of the Everly Brothers, Record labels began inserting re-record clauses into contracts that prevented the artists from re-recording the songs for a fixed time after the initial release or for a period of time after the end of a contract. It seems that Taylor Swift had a two-year wait after the end of her contract as she had publicly stated that she could legally start re-recording in November 2020, which is exactly two years after the deal expired. You may also remember back in 1993, Prince changed his name to just a symbol, and insisted on being referred to as the artist formerly known as Prince. Well, this was due to a similar contractual dispute over ownership. Prince signed his first deal age 19 with Warner, who gave him creative control and his own publishing company to manage his compositions. In return, they wanted him to sign an exclusive recording contract, with Warner owning his recordings in perpetuity. Forever, ever. This meant that any time Prince recorded a song, Warner would own it. And bear in mind, Prince isn't a made-up stage name. This is the name on his birth certificate. So effectively, Warner owned him. Now Prince thought that by recording under another name, he could sidestep this clause, so he started using the symbol instead of a name. This didn't work, and he remained bound by the terms of the Warner contract. Another notable band who re-recorded their own songs is Def Leppard. They had a clause in their contract that said they would have a say in the use of their masters in the future, but with no specification of what that actually meant. Now, when streaming sites like Spotify surfaced in the early 2000s, record labels had a new revenue stream for their old recordings, and they didn't even need to renegotiate the deals they had with the artists, as many of the contracts they'd made prior to the internet have future formats clauses. This gave the label the right to sell the music in formats yet to be invented, 
and didn't specify what royalty rates the artist would receive. Some labels even decided that the wording of some of these contracts meant they could legally not pay the artist anything at all for streaming. So when Def Leppard's label, Universal, put the band's songs on digital platforms, they didn't bother to negotiate with the band. When the band found out they were able to get their lawyer to have the songs taken down, while they negotiated new terms. In the meantime, they re-recorded some of their biggest hits, which were now 20 or more years old and outside of any re-record clause. They released the first re-recordings in 2012 and continued to block the label from selling their music digitally. They threatened to re-record their entire catalogue for release online, but only recorded a handful of songs, possibly because fans were not reacting well to the new recordings. Eventually the tactic did pay off, and in 2018 the band agreed terms with Universal for the digital sale of their music, and they removed the re-recorded versions. So what's the lesson to be learned here? Industry rule number 4080, record company people are shady. Or in the words of Taylor Swift. The music industry is, uh... <laughs> now what do you think? Was Taylor Swift right to be upset at the sale of her masters? Or was it just business? And what do you think of the new recordings? Are they better than the original versions? Let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to get all the latest videos.